I'm back, Dr. Vinay Prasad from the University of California, San Francisco. I'm here to talk about our new paper on the FDA's ODAC in late April that appears now in JAM Oncology. Let me show you to you because a uh, picture's worth a thousand words. Here it is. The Oncology Drug Advisory Committee votes of April 2020, implications for the fate of accelerated approval. It's by myself, Logan Powell, Mark Lithgow. It should be something very interesting for people interested in regulatory policy. And let me walk you through what it is and, and what it's about. First, I think you need to know something about accelerated approval. The US Food and Drug Administration has two fundamental types of approval. They have a regular or traditional marketing authorization, which means that they are largely satisfied with efficacy. They believe that the drug product has shown efficacy. And there may be further safety signal questions that they're asking you to explore, but they're not gonna ask you to re-demonstrate efficacy. They've accepted that you have shown your product is efficacious. There's also the accelerated approval pathway that came out in part of the HIV AIDS crisis in 1992. The accelerated approval pathway understands that for certain very debilitating, life-threatening conditions for which there are few treatment options, we have to make a societal bargain. We're willing to let drug products come to market on the basis of improvements in surrogate endpoints. Those are endpoints that occur a little bit sooner, but they're not in and of themselves clinically meaningful. And the surrogate endpoint may have some correlation with the thing you care about, living longer or living better. And the FDA defines accelerated approval as when that correlation is thought, quote, reasonably likely to predict. It's reasonably likely to predict, whatever that means. And we've explored that in a number of papers. Check out a paper in 2016 by myself and Chul Kim in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings. But be that as it may, the FDA is giving you a provisional right to sell your drug product without knowing for sure it actually makes us live longer or live better. In exchange, you have to show on the market in a, in a clinical study, your drug actually does what we think it does. It actually makes people live longer, live better. By the late April, we had 10, quote, dangling approvals. These were immunotherapy drugs, all checkpoint inhibitors, that received approval on the basis of response rate or uncontrolled, uh, uncontrolled measurements of tumor shrinkage. In other words, what fraction of people have 30% or more tumor shrinkage in an uncontrolled study? Were these approved because you live longer or live better than the alternative drugs? No. In fact, they didn't have randomized trial data. The FDA had post-marketing commitments for all 10 of these approvals. And in all of these cases, the post-marketing studies, the randomized trials, be they measuring PFS or OS, they failed. They failed to improve by their own pre-specified statistical plan. They failed to show benefit. So the FDA was left in this position, which is you've made a promise to show your drug works post-market. And if you don't meet that promise, we're going to yank the approval. And so they submitted these 10 things. Four of these 10 things, the companies voluntarily withdrew marketing authorization for those four. For the other six, they fought it. They said, let's take you to court. And that court is the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee. It is the ODAC. It is a group of oncologists from across the country, a little bit of statistical expertise, some patient advocacy. And they decide in a vote whether or not they think that the risk benefit profile of these products supports staying on the market or being withdrawn from market. In four of these six cases, and it really would have been five of six if Rick Pazder from the FDA didn't actually say something in one case. But in four of the six cases, they voted to keep these drug products on market even though the post-marketing studies had failed. This is a big deal. This is a really big deal. What does this mean? I guess there's several implications I think of and our paper describes the implications, but here they are. If the promise of accelerated approval is you get path to market based on a surrogate now, but you gotta show some proof later, and we enforce that proof, then I think the surrogate and the accelerated approval pathway, it's working as intended. If we don't enforce it, if four out of six times we let you off the hook, I think a number of things follow. Here's number one. Those four manu those manufacturers of those four indications that voluntarily withdrew, well, don't they look foolish? They should have fought it because there's a great chance in this court of oncologists who are often in a conflicted position with the company because they've received payments from the company, they're gonna receive payments, they work with the companies on trials, they're in a position that's very difficult to judge impartially. They might vote in your favor. So those four indications are withdrawn from market, boy, do they feel foolish. They should have fought them, taken them to the ODAC, and probably three out of four would have been approved and stayed on the market. So that's a loss for the companies and they won't make that mistake again. I suspect that going forward, every company will fight every, every drug withdrawal uh, tooth and nail and they'll win a lot because the oncology community has a difficult time withdrawing something that's there. So that's the second point. We have a tough time in biomedicine to give up something we've gotten used to giving. If you've never done a transvaginal ultrasound and CA125 for ovarian cancer screening, you're not that hurt when the UK randomized study shows no benefit. But if you've been doing it for years, like PSA testing, you're devastated when PLCO shows no benefit. Once you get used to something addicted to the combination of two factors, one, the 
the financial reimbursement of the of the intervention and two the genuine feeling that you're making people better that combination is the methamphetamine of being a doctor and you become quickly addicted and then once somebody shows you with evidence that it doesn't really work it's very difficult for you to let go of that and that is the theme of a book entitled ending medical reversal which we wrote a few years ago so that's also why it's going to be very difficult to get a negative vote out of this committee the second thing that happens so now the companies they're just going to push it you know, they're going to they're going to push it to the limit and they're going to take these, you know, failed drugs um, all the way to the ODAC. The next thing that happens is they're incentivized to run the trial poorly. They're going to run a shitty trial. And here's why. All of the biases that happen when you run something poorly with contamination, loss to follow up, poor adherence, um, have a slow enroll, um, even failing to accrue the, the target number of patients. These are all ways in which you'd run a trial poorly. They all bias towards the null. They bias towards finding no difference when in fact a difference even exists, but they bias towards finding no difference. They bias to the null. Now, if a company runs a study, a post-marketing commitment in the future, they have every incentive to do this. They're going to run it poorly. They're going to delay, obfuscate, take a long time to launch, stretch it out, say they didn't meet target accrual, you know, contaminate both arms with the other, with the product potentially, just to, just to say that all that stuff will mean it's more likely to have a negative study. But they know the Drug Advisory Committee, they're not going to hold a negative study against them. In fact, all of those design flaws and the failure to execute, the Drug Committee will use as a justification why you shouldn't accept the negative study and keep the product on market anyway. So it's just a great thing for the company. They can just run a poor quality study. And this has implications for aducanumab, which we'll talk about in a future video because we have a paper under review on this topic. Implications for physicians and patients we discuss in this paper. You know, it's going to be very difficult for a patient who now faces a cancer diagnosis to continue to decide whether or not they ought to take some drug. The entire purpose of drug regulation is to take somebody who is a vulnerable person, someone who's sick and dying and who doesn't know a lot about biomedicine and empower them to make good and safe and salutatory choices. But what this does is they have more choices, but we don't know if you live longer, live better as a result. So those are the key, those are the key takeaway messages. Um, well, there's one more. In many of these cases, the, the ODAC said, well, there's another confirmatory study that we'll, hang, that we'll use to make the final verdict. They say like, we won't decide right now, we'll wait for that future study. But that future study is even more removed from the original approval than the study they're looking at right now. Let's just consider the breast cancer studies. Um, you have an approval for atezolizumab in PDL1 positive breast cancer, triple negative breast cancer, that was contradicted in a study when it was paired with paclitaxel rather than abraxane. If you look at the totality of that evidence, it's pretty clear that I think it doesn't do anything and the burden is on the company to show it actually works. But now they're saying that paclitaxel study, well, that's not the same thing as Abraxane. It's not quite relevant. So we will wait for the next study. But the next study is a neoadjuvant study. And the neoadjuvant study has less to do with metastatic breast cancer than the paclitaxel study, which at least is metastatic breast cancer. So in the future, the drug companies and the ODAC will further keep these drugs on market, arguing that the next confirmatory study is even further removed from the original indication than the one we already looked at and thought, you know, let's let that slide. This is a fiasco. This is an evidence-based fiasco. And the FDA, as, as, as my colleague Bren, Ben Mazur nicely put it, the FDA is a melting iceberg. The FDA for a long time has been lowering the bar that leaves more toxic, costly products on the US market. We don't know if patients live longer or live better. Certainly we don't know it the way we give it to older people, to people with different combinations. We certainly don't know that. Um, but what this means is we'll continue to have this system. And so we're gonna have high profits, low regulatory hurdles, the companies are going to be happy. The patient advocacy groups that are paid by the companies, they're going to be happy. The FDA employees are going to be happy because the politicians are happy, because their lobbyists are happy, because the lobbyists of the pharmaceutical industry. The only people who can be impoverished and hurting are the average American people whose salaries have stagnated paying for this health care that we frankly don't know makes us any better. So those are my thoughts. The paper is out now. It's the Oncology Drug Advisory Committee votes of April, implications for the fate of accelerated approval. And I think you should check it out. I think uh, these are the implications, whether, whether we like it or not. And uh, well, I don't like it. And I think the system can be fixed and has to be fixed before it's too late.